It is Friday, March 15th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another emulated episode of LTPS. As always, let's begin with our PS Plus reminder. The March PS Plus Essential Games are still live on PSN, so make sure you claim those before they go away. Also, this coming Tuesday on the 19th, we have the PS Plus Extra and Premium lineup going live on PSN as well, which for PS Plus Extra, uh, really two big marquee titles headlining this month, which I would argue is going to be Marvel's Midnight Suns and also Resident Evil 3, uh, but you've still also got NBA on there, uh, Lego DC Supervillains, uh, Mystic Pillars Remastered, Super Neptunia RPG, and of course, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, so uh, RIP to one of the greats there, Akira Toriyama. Now going into PS Plus Premium, we have Jack and Daxter, The Lost Frontier for PSP, Cool Borders, PS1, God's Eater Burst PSP, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trilogy on PS4, and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle R, PS5, PS4 as well. Uh, one of the few times where we have five games on premium, uh, that being a mix of remasters and emulated classic titles. Uh, but Phoenix Wright, fantastic games, so great to have that on there. Uh, definitely recommend those. Cool Borders PS1, that is a classic. And then we have <laughs> Jack and Dexter, The Lost Frontier. Kind of the eyesore in that franchise, which, I mean, look, full disclosure, I'll take any classic games, um, even the ones that I'm not particularly fond of. So that's one where I'm not exactly beating down the door to play, where I wanted that one to come back. Um, maybe if it has trophies, which they've been pretty good about, you know, making sure the first party games do have a platinum trophy, then maybe we'll finally, uh, or at least I will go through the entire game. I played it back in the day and didn't really get all the way through it because, you know, I wasn't a big fan of where the, you know, the, the direction of that game, where it was going, but, you know, maybe we'll kind of do that as a separate upload if, um, you know, we have some time, but still cool to see that, and it's worth noting that it is very much the PSP version, not PS2, uh, which that has been the problem that goes nicely into our next story, which is how we might possibly be getting PS2 games finally, or at least that's uh, the speculation there, because what happened recently was earlier in the week, we had a brand new interview pop up on Time Extension, where Time Extension was talking with the Implicit Conversions co-founders, uh, or one of the co-founders, which Implicit Conversions is the company that is primarily responsible for uh, working on bringing back the PS1 and PSP games they are using their emulator. So this interview kind of dives into, you know, how the company came to be, how they got Sony as a client for bringing back all these games using their, what they call their syrup uh, emulation engine. And the interview uh, referenced a line from their site and also the company's LinkedIn that says specifically, uh, and I quote here, Currently, we are working with clients to bring back NES, PS1, PSP, and PS2 games to the PS4, PS5, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox. So naturally, this led many places to report on this and for people to speculate that new PS2 games were finally on the way. But when Time Extension reached out to the CEO again for clarification, they responded with, and I quote, Unfortunately, I can't deny or confirm anything about PS2. So if you heard about this, then that's where we stand right now. It's not actually confirmed if new PS2 games are finally coming, because that is the caveat. We do have PS2 games on the store, but it's a matter of that being from the old program on PS4 from 2016 to 2018. Uh, and those games have issues on PlayStation 5 when played through backwards compatibility, because there are no PS2 games that are natively uh, ported over and title ID'd as PlayStation 5 games. So these are uh, rather old titles that have graphical artifact issues on PS5 when played through backwards compatibility. So it was always something where, and I discussed this uh, last year in a separate upload about the main problem right now with Sony's Classics program, which is simply that a lot of publishers are not on board to, you know, re-release their games through Sony's program, right? So the way that Sony wants to price the games, how Sony wants them available on premium, it just seems very obvious that in terms of widespread publisher support, they've only got a few big names like Disney being one of the big ones, but, um, you know, that's the major issue. But at the time, I'd mentioned that, you know, I'd heard PS2 games are coming at some point with a new emulator. And that's not even a matter of like using any sort of inside knowledge that I had heard or whatever the case is, right? Because that's obviously how I framed it. Um, and I decided a long time ago, like usually with the channel, if I do hear something, I don't want to really go into the reporting side of things. But I digress. The point is, um, even without that, I think anybody can reasonably come to the conclusion that that's probably what's going to happen, right? I, eventually, we got to get PS2 games again, right? But it's something where they're probably doing a new emulator. The more surprising thing I, got, I guess we can say is that it was not widespread news as to, or at least information that, you know, Sony was outsourcing a lot of this work for the PS1 and PSP stuff, right? Um, I didn't know this at the time when Sony uh, relaunched PS Plus in 2022. I'd only found out about this company uh, sometime last year, which 
which is that it's not in-house. Like Sony is outsourcing most of this to this company with their syrup emulation engine uh, for the bulk of the PS1 and PSP stuff. In fact, uh, as far as I know for this company, like that's their number one client and it's really primarily what they do, even though the language on their site does imply that they've done, and they are doing some other projects, but um, you know, doing like bringing back NES games or also being able to ship stuff on Nintendo Switch or Xbox. I mean, they can really do anything. So they are independent and they're looking for more clients, but primarily the bulk of their work is what they've done for PlayStation Plus Premium and uh, bringing back a lot of these games, um, which is good, obviously. I, I, it's great that we have an independent company that is doing this kind of work and now their name is maybe more out there now than it was prior. Um, but yeah, for a long time, I thought Sony was doing a lot of this stuff in-house, but it seems like that's not the case. Anyway, we're really kind of going off on a tangent. The real important thing here is that they're not at liberty to discuss this. So again, it kind of goes back to what we said before. Reasonably, I think anybody can come to the conclusion that we're going to get new PS2 games at some point, and it's probably this company that is uh, responsible for doing it. But we have to wait for Sony to eventually confirm that uh, when once we see new PS2 games finally show up on uh, PlayStation Network uh, through the PS blog when they announce this stuff. Uh, maybe they will kind of make a big deal about it and say, hey, new PS2 games are finally coming, or maybe they won't say anything and we'll just see them finally pop up. Um, whatever the case is, we can't look at this though and say it's for sure confirmed because they are independent, so they can naturally say, yeah, we can do PS2 stuff and we are doing it for this other client, uh, which would be another you know completely different kind of project that's priced in a different manner not showing up on premium so we have to consider all that so for now that's kind of where we have to leave it but uh, I will say I will I would be shocked if we went this entire generation on PlayStation 5 and we see PS1 and PSP stuff come back but not <laughs> not PS2 it would just it would be really silly and frustrating so um, yeah I think it's more a matter of when not if now, moving on to our next news story, the next major PS5 system software update is now live on PSN 24.02, uh, 9.00, which uh, I use the word major loosely there because this is not really a big substantial update. Uh, in fact, it's not even mandatory the last time I checked, so you don't have to install it right now if you don't want to. Uh, but it is something where we discussed uh, all the features on Wednesday, which it's primarily five things. Uh, the DualSense speaker volume being increased. The DualSense mic is now using an AI machine learning model to reduce reject background noise and button presses. There's a new share screen interaction feature you can use. Um, there's also adjusting the brightness of the PS5's power indicator, and there's a new shutdown animation, which the shutdown animation is the only thing on there that was not in the change log. So really it's four things that they initially outlined, but five features overall. So really disappointing. Even though in the Wednesday video, we did see that um, the speaker volume and the reject the rejection of background noises, actually, it's quite substantial. Uh, it turns out that they did do a pretty good job there in terms of, I mean, increasing the volume and uh, trying to make the mic a little bit more usable from the dual sounds. But I think for the vast majority of people, if you did not have those comparisons, you probably were not going to even notice that anyway. So yeah, we're still missing some pretty big things uh, on the, the system firmware. We'll probably have another firmware sort of in the midpoint of the year and uh, probably a, a very big one by around September. It seems like that's the timeline they've uh, been using recently. But yeah, that's really all we had for the PS5 firmware recently. Now, that was not the only firmware that got sent out recently. PS4 also got 11.50, which it was even less exciting than PS5, where the only two change log items on there is improving system software performance and stability and improving the messages and usability on some screens. And you would presume that also includes updating Blu-ray keys, but otherwise that is it. So PS4 is more than likely in that area of just getting... Uh, Blu-ray key updates every single year, um, considering it did not even get the share screen interactions, which it was getting share screen and share play uh, updates, I think, right up until, you know, before PS5 came out, if I remember my timeline correctly. But yeah, it's something where at this point, PS4 security updates, um, Blu-ray keys, and that's kind of where we're at with PS4, which means that it'll still get those for the foreseeable future, considering PS3 still to a degree sees those on an annual basis. Next up, we have another very big notable leak coming out of the Insomniac Breach where, uh, well, again, when that happened, that was 1.7 terabytes of data. So it was a lot. We're talking millions of files. So it was not something where that data was going to get sifted through in like a weekend. So like people are still finding things. And so what was found recently was actual footage of what we did find out about pretty much right away, which was the presumed canceled Spider-Man The Great Web 
multiplayer game, which is something that, um, you know, at the time we all kind of suspected anyway that they were probably working on uh, some kind of multiplayer. Well, at the time we thought it was maybe a multiplayer component of Spider-Man 2, and that was looked at. Same for, you know, using that in Spider-Man 3, also doing a separate game. Uh, a long time ago, we had job listings suggesting that they were looking to stay in a, you know, an existing universe, which it's like, okay, that's probably a Marvel property. That was well before the, the breach. So not exactly the most surprising revelation, uh, which by the way, we're only showing screenshots because I can't play the actual video in its entirety just for safeguarding the channel as far as copyright goes. Uh, but something where we now have footage of the great web and it's it's very much kind of a vertical slice uh, spruced up trailer that's trying to maybe, uh, it may be used as more of a pitch before the project uh, gets a, a proper green light and they start actually making the thing to release commercially. So again, we presume it's canceled um, and it's something where it's kind of like a, a Spider-Verse style game. Again, we saw slides of it before, so we kind of know what the sales pitch was for this game, uh, going through Manhattan with different Spider-Men and attacking uh, and taking on all the villains. Definitely a cool premise, but something where, um, and this is kind of the case for a lot of studios, but uh, even with this being canceled, it doesn't mean we won't see these assets used in something else. It doesn't mean they won't use the core technologies that they built for the, you know, the, the sort of foundation of the multiplayer they were making, on, uh, making in this game, excuse me. Um, um, so we might see this pop up in maybe another project down the road, which, um, you know, it, it, they, we know that they're still hiring for multiplayer anyway. And if you did kind of dive further into the, uh, the insomniac breach, then there's certainly a suggestion that they're considering that, uh, that possibility. Next up, we have a rumor for The Last of Us Part 2's PC announcement coming sometime next month. Based on what was said from the account Silk Knight over on X, where if you remember last week's episode of LTPS, we touched on this account where they were discovered recently and they were seemingly getting things correct about uh, state of play announcements or uh, PlayStation blog posts for Tsushima PC. And so as we discussed at the time, it's something where the account probably does have some insight with maybe knowing somebody on the regional marketing side, maybe a social media team member, uh, whatever the case is, that does seem to be quite common. So they might be uh, privy to the info that the blog post announcement is slated for sometime next month, which would be kind of far out. Um, and also knowing that the actual PC shipment is maybe further out from the announcement of the game itself, which uh, if anything, if, if we want to humor that idea, I mean, it is something where um, as far as like who's been making all these PC versions go, we see that Nexus does a lot of them, but uh, Naughty Dog has been doing a lot of them in-house. And so that was the, you know, more surprising thing about part two when it was announced for PS5 is that it was not some sort of immediate PS5 and PC announcement uh, on the PS blog. So it might be something where they just want to make sure this game is, you know, still baking in the oven and making a lot of good progress and that they were able to, well, able to not only show, but also ship a competent PC version since that has been a problem with Naughty Dog doing these games in house. So I would suspect that's what they're getting at when they say, oh, the announcement is going to be far away from the, uh, well, the announcement would be soon, but rather shipping the game would be further out. So I suspect that's probably what's going to happen here. Um, but even then, it's probably still going to you know ship by the end of this year, I'd have to imagine, if they are planning on announcing it next month. But uh, we'll keep watching this account and also this rumor and see if they are correct uh, with this news. Now, one really fascinating thing that popped up last Friday after LTPS, this was around maybe 4 p.m. Eastern time, somewhere around there, uh, but a Stellar Blade demo popped up randomly on PSN. It was not coinciding with a, you know, a blog post about the game. There was no new news, just a free demo on PSN out of nowhere, which meant a lot of people went to go download it. And that also means after like 20 minutes, Sony then pulled the demo because obviously this was, this was not supposed to happen. Um, but the more surprising news here is that Sony then revoked the license from people's accounts if they did get the demo in time. So uh, something where if you were at all connected to PSN, whether your console is on or in rest mode, because rest mode still means you're connected online to download patches, then they removed the license from your account. So you can no longer launch the game, even if it is still installed on your console. Um, which a lot of people are surprised that they can do that. Uh, they can, clearly, uh, although it's something where they never have a reason to. So I know some people are kind of, you know, sort of jumping into the complaint area of like, oh, I can't believe Sony can do this, or I can't believe they did do it. Why not let people uh, play the game or whatever? Or, you know, this is the digital landscape that we live in, right? So it's like, I don't know. I mean, sure, like, it's bad news there, but generally, like, there's no, like, companies are not going to just 
do that for no reason. So we can understand why this happened and the way that it did happen. Um, Because really, there's almost no other examples I can think of offhand where Sony has had to do this. But yeah, they can in theory. The only bad news is that like they're willing to do this very quickly to resolve something that was really beneficial to people. But you know, going back to our story from last week where people were losing the licenses to their entire digital library and engineers are still trying to figure out what's going on, which as a brief update to that story, there are still some users that do not have uh, a resolution to that. So I'm still watching it, seeing what happens. Um, the original poster of that thread still has no luck, uh, which is unfortunate. So it's like, whenever it's a problem for the customer, the resolution takes a long time. But when it's something where it's like this, it's beneficial. Yeah, <laughs> they try and fix it right away. Having said that, uh, the demo itself is about an hour and a half long. So for those that did get to play the game, then, well, kudos to you. Uh, there is footage online, so at least it's archived that way so you can actually see the demo. Um, and it's always great to have uninterrupted gameplay of the, uh, you know, whatever the game is. And because we've only seen like quick jump cuts and things like that and things that the publisher wants you to see. So in this case, um, nice to see the demo and at least get an idea of what the gameplay loop is like for that brief moment. And we also know that the game is going to get a demo at some point, which is obviously the, the better news here. Now, in other Stellar Blade news, we can also mention for the game's developer, Shift Up, uh, they recently filed an application on March 5th for taking the company public on the South Korean Stock Exchange. So they are looking to distribute shares and uh, be a publicly traded company where their valuation is at $2.3 billion, which is an insane amount. Uh, although we do have to remember that Stellar Blade is really their only you know console single player game that they're doing, their first one. Uh, but they're more well known for doing Goddess of Victory, where that's a, a gotcha game that came out two years ago so i'm sure that's been a very big key revenue driver for the studio um but yeah they are looking to go public so i know for many that's um always been more in the speculation area of what studio will sony acquire this game based on how well it does maybe that would be a good candidate but um it seems more likely that and especially in today's climate uh sony would probably be a minority investor so i would think that if sony um is looking to make any sort of investments in studios, then this would be a sound one, especially given the talent, where they're located, the fact that they do have experience in mobile games as well. So really th that does kind of tick a lot of boxes as far as not only an acquisition, but certainly um, investing into the studio goes. So probably that we'll see, um, maybe Tencent as well. So for now we'll have to keep watching this, but it looks like Shift Up is looking to go public. Now let's move on to Rise of the Ronin, the PS5 exclusive from Team Ninja where previews got sent out on Monday. So we now have a good idea of how the game is shaping up for the opening hours of the game. And uh, that is something where the embargo is put on like a main mission story path. So like the first hour in, but for a lot of previews, they're still exploring the open world, doing side quests. So a lot of this is based on the first four to five hours. But uh, just to summarize what we're hearing about so far, the key points I keep seeing across a number of previews is that it definitely does feel more accessible with difficulty options. Um, there's more checkpoints that serve as lessening the punishment if you die, but it does still have souls elements with what progress does and does not carry over when you die. Some previews noted that the gameplay does still feel like a Team Ninja game, while others are of the mind that this feels different and more casual focused, uh, more akin to a Tsushima instead of a Neo or Wolong. Some of the earlier districts in the game, uh, the game's open world will have you working up the bond level for them, uh, which is then going to unlock additional side quests. So if you remember that one trailer showed us a bond system for the characters, uh, but there is also one for the areas in the game. Uh, Push Square was keen to point out that this game has a presentation level that is really unlike any other in past Team Ninja games, more akin to recent Sony blockbusters. Rise of the Ronin gets uh, pretty flashy with the opening sequence and the story cutscenes, which is new for Team Ninja as far as like, you know, really trying to zero in on doing a proper narrative that is supposed to hook you and grab you, um, which apparently that does go in conflict with the game's less than stellar moments in the presentation department. So it is a little bit rough. Uh, apparently the performance mode is not hitting 60 consistently, or at least 
least it doesn't feel like that. Um, there is some pop-in that occurs frequently, and there's uh, locations like Yokohama that appear pretty empty as well, so um, there's that. Another interesting point brought up is the very real sense of the game's plot diving into the Western and Eastern conflict, how one environment is very much Japanese, and then the next you see buildings of Western influence. So across the board, it does seem like people are in either enjoying it a lot or some that just don't love it, which is not a bad thing inherently. Really, nobody's saying that they hate the game or that it's awful, just that they're either really enjoying it or they're just not in love with it or they're not as much they're, they're not enjoying it as much as maybe they thought they would going into it considering uh they're pa like past team ninja games which um again not a bad thing but it does seem like the game is maybe shaping up to be something that team ninja is you know really trying to explore new things maybe uh able to appeal to a wider audience considering neo or wolong can be a little bit more niche especially in the gameplay department so um you know i guess it, it depends on how they're going how well they'll accomplish that goal of speaking to a wider audience while at the same time appeasing fans of team ninja games that and also they're going right up against dragon's dogma 2 which that is on the opposite end of the coin here where um that's been getting a ton of praise left and right people loving that game so far so it does seem like if we try and um you know pin a metacritic score on this game right now maybe like Mm, high 70s low 80s would maybe be a best case scenario based on what we're hearing right now of course we'll talk about it more next week when we do get those final numbers but uh being right up against dragon's dogma 2 now it might be a little bit nerve-wracking for team ninja um because it seems like this game is maybe not going to land in a very big way that they were hoping for. But again, we'll talk more about this sometime next week. Uh, but still nice to get a, a better idea of what the game is really going for now. Moving on to a fresh new PlayStation 5 Pro rumor, this one coming from the YouTube channel Moore's Law is Dead, where they primarily cover leaks, rumors, and happenings in the video game technology and computer space, and so this time around they have what appear to be uh, alleged documentation internally from Sony that was given to developers to brief them on this upcoming high-end PlayStation 5 console coming out uh, by the end of this year, we still assume, and uh, it is something where they have to throw a bunch of watermarks on it, but also like heavily obscure the documentation uh, in order to protect sources assuming it is legitimate which uh, that kind of goes into the sort of obvious notion that for many they consider that maybe uh, Moore's Law is dead has been uh, unreliable or has provided dubious information in the past which again I can't really speak too much on that because I haven't followed every single upload they've done and fact checked all of it but as far as PlayStation stuff goes uh, there was something in here that really caught my eye and I think is worth bringing up for this discussion so uh, first the actual information at hand uh, where the Trinity code name is still present on there so kind of keeping in line with what we've said before where uh, Shakespeare has been a theme for PS5 code terminology um, but this document does explain that this is the high-end PS5 console uh, coming out at some point. Uh, GPU rendering performance is about 45% faster than the standard PS5. Uh, ray tracing performance is noted as two to three times over the standard console, uh, or four times in some cases. T-flops would be around 33.5, uh, 56 CUs total. The console will utilize a custom machine learning architecture for what Sony is allegedly calling this uh, PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution, or PSSR for short, uh, and apparently there's support for 8K resolution planned in future versions of the SDK, and this is intended to replace uh, the games uh, that are currently using you know temporal anti-aliasing or temporal upsampling um, no training is needed on a per title basis for this technology either um, it's also uh, meant to be a, a dynamic input resolution changing the base resolutions and outputs um, in relation to frame rate performance obviously uh, considering this is an internal document for developers they're also being briefed on the memory requirement that being 250 megabytes and that could change over time but right now that's kind of what they're saying and uh, there's also images where Sony is benchmarking PSSR to FSR using Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart as an example, where again, the images are being obscured, so you can't actually look at these images and try to find differences or anything, like that's not possible. But uh, at the very least, that is really the thing that stuck out the most to me is PSSR, PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution. It's just, it's something where that is the most believable part to me outside of like, I would say rational, uh, like specs with the performance and like the, the T flop count and 56 CUs, some of the stuff we've already heard before. But, um, it's simply a matter of like, 
outside of whether you consider, excuse me, the source reliable or not, just that's something PlayStation would do, right? Especially considering how much of a household name DLSS or FSR is nowadays in the technology and computer landscape, and Sony is shipping PC games nowadays anyway, and I mean, it's something that we saw very similar to the PS4 Pro, which is checkerboard rendering. That was in-house technology that was not just, like, that was not a name they only used for developers with, um, you know, briefing them, and that was in the SDK. Like, they used that, that language and terminology during the reveal. Hey, consumers checkerboard rendering right it would be in sony's best interest to you know also have their own branding that they would utilize on console but also for eventual pc releases and they they would be right up to fsr and uh, dlss as well right it's certainly within their interest to you know start doing this stuff and i mean really we know they're working on this stuff anyway it's sony they're a multi-billion dollar corporation that uh, is very much interested in uh, ai as much as anybody else and in this case we already know they're using you know machine learning tech uh, in practice right now with the recent firmware for enhancing uh, things like the dual sense uh, uh, microphone, right? So it's, I mean, that just stuck out as the most sort of like, oh, this this might be genuine. More so because like, again, the, the timeline sort of implies that we're just gonna get more PS5 Pro leaks anyway. Um, so the, I mean, the closer we get, the more genuine the stuff is likely going to be because more developers are going to have this stuff. There's gonna be SDK revisions right up until, you know, it's sort of finalized and we get a, you know, a, a batch of games that are going to be poised for day one uh, PS5 Pro titles. And in the case of the actual specs being outlined, a lot of it is just going to amount to you know, expected uh, higher frame rates, higher sustained frame rates. So games that struggle to hit 60 can start hitting 60. Games that uh, are completely unlocked up to 120, you know, if they're floating in the 80, 80, 90 range, maybe they can get pushed up to 120. That would be the most, I think, realistic use case. Uh, although it seems like there would be some advantages, uh, advantages to a studio pursuing, uh, you know, actual ray tracing applications that maybe are a bit more substantial and they don't have to uh, take such a big hit to resolution or frame rate. So we might see certain games try to really amp it up in the, the graphics and beauty department, the presentation style. I mean, there's a lot of ways this can go, but um, that's kind of where we are on this very recent PS5 Pro leak. The PSSR branding, I, I think, is that might have been the smoking gun on this if, if this is genuine uh, material that came out. Moving on to Deviation Games, the brand new studio founded by industry veterans Dave Anthony and Jason Blundell, where they initially got funding from Sony to make a new IP for PlayStation 5, kind of a big deal at the time, but then we saw that Jason Blundell left the company, Sony backed out of that deal, it was never confirmed, but it seemed pretty obvious because then Deviation uh, had 80% of the company laid off, and so it wasn't really looking that good last time we checked in on Deviation. It seemed like maybe they were doing okay because they had new job postings, so maybe Maybe they found a new publisher, but seems like that did not work out because the studio is now shut down, confirmed by the studio's uh, head of HR and operations officer over on LinkedIn, and then with several other employees confirming as well. So that is the story of Deviation. Unfortunately, they were only around for about two years, and um, that's sometimes how game development goes. This was actually something where that was over a year, well, not, over a year ago, close to a year ago, but Sony walked away from that deal. Um, you know, well before like the recent whole layoff thing that, that happened, right? So this was uh, about a year ago that Sony walked away from that project. We don't know what happened, but the running theory that makes the most sense is that, you know, there was some kind of uh, conflict internally with the co-founders on maybe the direction of this game and where they wanted to take it. Uh, Jason Blundell left the company and now we know that Jason Blundell is at PlayStation. And uh, we also know a lot of former Deviation staff were poached from Deviation to uh, PlayStation. Well, poached, I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, they did, I think, all go there after they were laid off. But either way, I mean, it's something where, <laughs> I guess, in theory, we might still be getting this game. It's it's just not from Deviation anymore. It's from whatever this new team is at PlayStation that's being formed internally. So uh, Sony has not really said much of anything about what has been going on. It's really something where we, we just know of this based on uh, job postings and what uh, JC once said when he confirmed that uh, Jason is now at SIE. So that's really where we have to leave it. But um, 
if we assume it's a matter of like creative differences and where this game should go, it seems like Jason probably won out and we are still potentially getting this game. It's just not from Deviation, which is a shame that Deviation was not able to find funding and uh, get off the ground. As we've said before, it's just, it's been a very tough year for the games business. Moving on to this uh, new video put out by CNBC's YouTube channel about PlayStation's 30-year history, uh, which CNBC, obviously a, a legacy uh, publication, they're not exactly putting out any sort of new information out there that, that we don't already know about the PlayStation business, um, but they did speak with Jim Ryan, Sean Layden, Herman Hulst, and we did get some interesting quotes that I thought were at least worth sharing in relation to them looking back at the PlayStation 3, so we don't get that too often where they get to you know talk about an older platform and certainly one like that so uh jim ryan on the playstation 3 he said and i quote i think i'd sort of say that maybe we got a bit too carried away with the success that we've been enjoying on playstation 2 and we kind of stumbled a little bit at the start of that generation and the early days were difficult herman hulse said it was very very powerful but it was also very expensive and it was frankly hard to develop for we needed to work really hard with some amazing franchises Jim Ryan did also confirm that he had not played video games when he joined the company in 94, uh, but he was amazed at what the PlayStation was capable of at the time. And later on, he says during the PS4 cycle that he was playing a lot of FIFA. So seems like maybe he was more on the casual side by the time he did start working in the games business. And uh, so it was funny to hear him say like, oh yeah, I played a lot of FIFA on PS4 uh, at the time. But um, Jim also gave a very tame comment on the ABK deal, simply saying that this was, you know, a very big deal compared to everything that has happened so far. Uh, but he was very happy with the 10 year agreement they signed for Call of Duty. And again, saying that the first deal they got was not what they eventually signed, but we've already covered all that anyway. So yeah, Again, there's nothing really new in there, but at the very least for, you know, a legacy publication where they can sometimes easily get access to Jim Ryan, Sean Layden, Herman Hulse, like sometimes we get some cool quotes out of there. And so it was cool to hear Jim at least uh, speak on something like PlayStation 3, which, uh, you know, <laughs> I think he was putting it lightly. Like, I think we were enjoying our success a little bit too much. Oh, you think? $600 in 2006 money? Oh man, I love PlayStation 3 and that disaster of 2006, but uh, still, it was a really cool video. I'll leave it linked in the description if you want to go check it out. Now, some other interesting quotes to go over are from also Sean Layden, but this time he's speaking with Dean Takahashi of VentureBeat. Uh, Sean Layden, of course, the former chairman of Worldwide Studios, the former president and CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment America. And so in this piece, he's discussing primarily his uh, consulting work with uh, NowReady.gg, which is a blockchain NFT company. But uh, Sean is going more into the, you know, the possibility of having a, a problem-solving approach for maybe creating a secondhand digital games market and how there would be a kickback for publishers for every transaction to somebody else and how that would be an incentive and win-win for both parties. And so it's actually a pretty fascinating piece. But uh, what we're here to talk about is more about his, uh, the quote that he gave in response to what Dean had mentioned for the recent announcement from Microsoft, which is them shipping games on uh, new platforms, uh, competing platforms, how the market is not really growing in a way that, you know, makes uh, addressable sense for them. And so uh, Sean, said, and I quote here, absolutely. When your costs for a game exceed $200 million, exclusivity is your Achilles heel. It reduces your addressable market, particularly when you're in the world of live service gaming or free to play. Another platform is just another way of opening the funnel, getting more people in. In a free to play world, as we know, 95% of those people will never spend a nickel. The business is all about conversion. You have to improve your odds by cracking the funnel open. Helldivers 2 has shown that for PlayStation, coming out on PC at the same time, again, you get that funnel wider, you get more people in. But if you're spending $250 million, you want to be able to sell to as many people as possible, even if it's just 10% more. The global installed base for consoles, if you go back to the PS1 and everything else stacked up there, wherever in time you look at it, the community of consoles out there never gets over $250 million. It just doesn't. The dollars have gone up over time, but I look at that and I see that we're just taking more money from the same people. That happened during the pandemic, which made a lot of companies overinvest. Look at our numbers going up. We have to chase that rocket. Sean is 100% correct. It's something we talk about fairly often, whether it's about uh, how the console business, it does not really grow. It's always around 200 to 250 million. So 
platform holders are always just trying to capture as many of those people as possible in relation to their competitors. And then for something like PS Plus with the relaunch, they're never going to get over 50 something million PS Plus subscribers. Not well over, I should say. So how do you make more? You just extract more money from the same people. So you introduce more expensive tiers. So it's kind of things that we've always touched on. But you know, this year has certainly been one where the games business has been hurting in a way where a lot of companies going under, a lot of layoffs, uh, and really trying to consolidate with these ballooning budgets and Microsoft being in a position where you know, for them with how many consoles they have in the market, it just makes more sense versus Sony to start shipping on PlayStation and Nintendo where, you know, it sees fit for them. And certainly they've got all these publishers under their uh, belt now and a, a plethora of studios. So certainly um, they have a lot of upside in terms of shipping on other platforms. But uh, for Sony, you know, Sean makes a, a really fascinating point here, which is even just 10% more, you know, PlayStation doesn't have nearly as much pressure to ship on say Xbox or Nintendo when they already have a big enough install base. But um, when you consider how big game budgets are getting and then how 10% more sales, even that is, is worth it in some cases. I mean, is that advantageous enough to where, you know, do we have some kind of timeline here down the road where Sony is maybe incentivized to ship on Xbox or Nintendo, much like Microsoft is considering themselves, right? Uh, or even Nintendo, which I, I think between Sony and Nintendo, they would be a lot more stubborn to eventually do that. I mean, in the here and now, they're, they're certainly not doing it. I mean, even PC releases, they're only doing it for uh, live service games where that really does make the most sense, right? To uh, really address that market. But um, it is something we're thinking about and even more so for what kind of PlayStation we would have today if Sean Layden were still a part of the company and if he were maybe to continue climbing the ladder to where, I mean, there's really one other position he could have gotten at that point, which would be uh, leading the entirety of SIE. So um, it's just something to think about for, for now, but still, uh, I, thought th I thought that was worth discussing and bringing up. Moving on to our next story, Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest has been confirmed for June 7th. So it's really something where we can just mention that that's the date. And uh, we still expect that Sony will probably do something around that time frame. I thought maybe April, so it would be like much sooner than the sort of E3 time frame. Uh, but I, from what we're hearing, maybe it is closer to what we saw last year, which would be May uh, or late May. So close enough, it would be something where it's preceding all the industry E3 news. So Sony would really get a lot of that stuff out there first with what we assume is another showcase, another presentation. Um, but whether that does or does not happen, at the very least, we know that Jeff Keighley shows, they often bring something there anyway. So uh, we might have some big PlayStation news coming, which uh, I know we're beating a dead horse here, but there are many things that we can and should be expecting to hear about fairly soon. Concord being one of them, where that game is still going to ship this year. And all we have is a CG trailer of a burger falling apart in space. And I'll tell you, I'm actually excited to see that game because it's something we have not had a long time in PlayStation history, which is a sci-fi first person uh, PVP game. So I actually really want to see what that is going to look like, and I suspect we are going to see it very, very soon. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway, where three of you could win a code for Melatonin on PlayStation 5, out now. Thank you again to Half Asleep Games for providing the giveaway, and I would like to congratulate these viewers right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or X, and now we'll be going back to a $10 PSN code, so if you would like to win, then follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week, because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all, and our Tuesday video was a review of the Pulse Explorer PS5 wireless earbuds. Uh, finally got that done, so like I said, we're behind, but we're also catching up finally. And then on Wednesday, we also did a look at the new PS5 system software, so uh, if you want to see a comparison of how much better the controller mic and speaker is, then you can go check out that very quick upload. Uh, and that is pretty much it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.